It was a quiet, cold November evening. Usually, I wouldn't dare to set foot outside at this time, especially since the sun had vanished behind the monoliths that are peaks behind the Alps. Hiking can be dangerous in the dark, and I had but the littlest, most pathetic source of light that could still be considered a torch. It was mounted to my beanie cap, and barely illuminated the next six feet or so. Every other day I would hike during the few spare hours of daylight after I finished work. But today I had to work the late shift as well, due to a co-worker unexpectedly falling sick. I really didn't mind, since I hadn't anything else planned for the day. But thinking back, it would have been much smarter to hike the new trail by day. The lamp flickered. Before me lay layers of snow, rocks and gravel. The scene looked like a small avalanche had ravaged through the path, and it took many rocks with it. The barricade was not impassable, but I believe my second mistake was that I didn't see the warning signs of what was about to come. About half an hour later, my lamp lost a significant amount of battery charge as it grew dimmer and dimmer by the minute. I had no spare batteries left, so I thought about turning around and making my way home. There was my next mistake. I didn't. My lamp eventually refused to fulfil its purpose, so I stumbled through the mountain trails in the dark now, only led by the bit of white barely visible. The trail was snowed over, and I could use that snow to orientate myself. To the left was a handrail, to the right was a steep incline. Both would eventually assure that I would not trip and fall to my demise. Multiple times, in fact. I was... a moron for continuing my way. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. Because after another 50 minutes, I stepped into a small crevice in the ground, invisible without my light and I am certain that this was where I broke my ankle. I fell to the side, and the sudden rush of pain and the loud cracking noise immediately made me fear for the worst. And the confirmation that it was indeed fractured led me down many paths of insane assumptions. At first I believed that I would be bleeding because the blood pressure in my foot was rising and I could feel every pump of my fragile heart. The place where it fractured became really warm and swollen. By now I was bleeding quite a bit. I had to stop the bleeding by wrapping my foot in my scarf, which would prove to be an excellent bandage. Then, I feared that I would not be able to make my way back home, since I'd been hiking for quite some time now. Even pulling out the foot had caused so much mind-numbing pain. How would I walk like this for, well, approximately two and a half hours back? I was walking for three hours now and I still had not reached the area with the avalanche yet. Snow was falling from the sky. So did on some occasion, hailstones. I used the hand railing for extra stability, but it didn't help me too much. It must have been way past midnight now. 
while the sun was still hours from rising. I knew I had reached the area of the avalanche and had some trouble passing by. While I did manage to cross it, I looked up to the place of origin. A large piece of snow was missing from an overhang some 60 or 70 feet above me. On its way down, it must have hit more than just a few rocks though, as now I took my time to actually observe the pile of snow. It contained human remains. I had left my phone at home that day, which also explained why I was not able to call an air ambulance to my position, but neither could I now report the untimely passing of a fellow hiker. Did I mention that I'd made some really stupid mistakes? Well, I made another. I was sure that the body had not been here before, because I didn't remember seeing it the first time I passed. I came closer to observe it. When suddenly, its hand started to reach for me. I ran. Mind you, I was in massive shock from both the pain and the arm. The person was more than clearly dead because a large rock had obliterated its cranium and the limbs were all contorted. Yet it moved its arm and almost managed to touch me. Running was not easy. Sometimes I lost grip on the railing and almost fell. Sometimes I hit the ground too hard with my broken ankle but I had to make sure I put as much distance between myself and that thing as possible. I kept looking back, but my gaze only met with the vast emptiness of the snow and my own bloody trail of footprints. Had I fantasized all of this? Was this some hallucination created by my massive loss of blood. Suddenly, I could see a light. Somebody was walking towards me, and they had light. I started yelling, and as they saw me, they froze. Probably 20 feet before me stood an elderly woman who had the biggest look of pure terror and distress on her face that her facial muscles had allowed her to have as she slowly started to point behind me. I turned my head and I locked eyes with a large, dark, hunched over figure. Well... Locked eyes would be an exaggeration. The figure had no real head. Whatever was left in that smashed visage could only be described as looking into the pits of hell. If they were comprised of human bone and flesh. For it had the most mangled body I'd ever seen. The woman started to yell some incomprehensive words as everything went numb. A large, hard object, previously obscured by the figure's coat, had been swung at the side of my head with a force greater than any I'd ever felt. My eardrum, on the corresponding side, ruptured. Just one of many more injuries I sustained. I fell. And frankly, I don't remember anything that followed. I awoke in a cabin. I was positioned in an armchair, 
wrapped in warm blankets, and had my feet placed in a tub of warm water. The fractured foot had stopped bleeding, and stained the tub and some towels beside in a dark shade of red, reminiscent of the red velvet cake that was sitting on a platter to my right. The old lady I'd seen earlier was sitting in a different room, facing an old television, likely asleep. As I looked back at my foot, I realised that my head didn't hurt anymore, and as I raised my hand to inspect the wound, I realised that there was, in fact, no wound at all. My eardrum was still hurting, but there was no blood, no shards of bone, no clumps of flesh protruding from my skin. It seemed as though it had just vanished. After a while, the lady woke up. She saw that I was awake too, and came to where I sat. She calmly explained to me that she had observed me going up to the Alps, but never saw me coming back. So, as she was worried I could have gotten hurt, she started her ascent a few hours later to look for me. She said that she found me, half buried beneath a large pile of snow. I looked as pale as a corpse, because I'd lost a lot of blood that day. Although, after questioning her, she said that there was not a trace of any other person. I was lucky that she had been a nurse before she retired else she would not have handled my injuries with such ease. I noticed a large photograph on her wall. The man that was pictured had similar clothes to the corpse I hallucinated in the snow. So I asked her about it. The same expression of pure terror and panic overwhelmed her. The man I had been sure I had seen was her husband. He died in an avalanche 25 years ago, and his body had never been found. Hikers claim this region of the Alps to be haunted, and that they are plagued by sightings of a body in the snow. These sightings become drastically more common during or after an avalanche is struck. She claimed that after his death, avalanches and avalanche-related deaths became much more common, and that I was one of the very few lucky people to leave this trail alive. One thing is sure. I will never go hiking in the Alps. Ever. Again.